Guys, it is finally here. Napoleon's invasion of Russia, 1812. Napoleon is going to march into Russia with more than half a million troops. And without spoiling too much, not even close to the number of those are even going to make it out of Russia. This epic campaign, I cannot wait to, to get to the rest of these videos, but this is just the beginning of it. I'm super excited. I've been loving this series so far. If you haven't been following along recently, I've been doing every single one of the Napoleon series by Epic History TV, and this is the big one. This is the big, this is definitely the biggest action that Napoleon will ever take, and this is one of a multi-part series. So without further ado, let's get into it. If you haven't already yet, go check out the other videos. They're fantastic. Go check out Epic History TV. They're amazing producers, and... Let's go. If you haven't already yet, remember to like, comment, subscribe as well. Let's go. Let's do it. Russia, 1812. Napoleon invades his former ally with the largest army Europe has ever seen. But for the French Emperor, the decisive blow remains frustratingly beyond reach. Yep. Russia's resilience is unlike anything he's ever encountered. And as winter closes in, his army begins the most infamous retreat in history. Wow. Yep. And, uh, and that retreat, I was talking about luck in a few videos before I... I think it was two videos back now and how much luck Napoleon had and I think he had a famous quote that's something along these lines that he would rather have you know he would rather have a lucky general than a, than a good general or something along these lines and his retreat out of Russia fortune luck fate whatever you want to call it certainly plays a role in that in 1807 following his defeat of the Russian army at Friedland Napoleon had travelled to Tilsit to meet the Russian Emperor Alexander. During their celebrated encounter, the two emperors formed a friendship and made an alliance. But it was not to last. Over the next five years, relations between France and Russia cooled dramatically. The Russians were irritated by Napoleon's creation of a Duchy of Warsaw in Poland, which they regarded as meddling in their own front yard. They feared it would lead to the return of a fully-fledged Polish state, a traditional thorn in Russia's side. Then there was Napoleon's offer to marry Alexander's sister, Grand Duchess Anna Pavlovna, to cement their alliance. But the Romanovs hated the idea, and after a year of Russian prevarication, Napoleon married Marie-Louise, daughter of the Austrian Emperor, yes. instead. And it's important to remember that at this point, really, marriage is just politics. <laughs> so, so much, um, I guess you could call it hereditary politics in some sort of way, marriage politics, but that's really all marriage was at this point. And so for them, for Austria, to obviously one of the more powerful empires, one of the major countries on the European continent, to then tie closer ties to the, Fr to the French, which at this point is the most powerful nation on the earth. Sorry, British, uh, sorry, sorry, Anglophiles, but I would argue is the most powerful nation on earth. And um, yeah, so just really cementing these ties even closer. And you got to think, what if he did actually marry the, the, the Russian princess there? What would have happened? Later that year, Napoleon broke a guarantee made at Tilsit and annexed the Duchy of Oldenburg ruled by Alexander's sister's father-in-law. Worst of all was the fallout over the continental system. Napoleon's not very effective economic blockade against Britain, designed to cripple his most steadfast enemy. <laughs> Alexander had agreed to join the continental system at Tilsit. But it was hugely unpopular in Russia and ruinous to her finances during a period of economic crisis. And as they said too, it was also incredibly hard to enforce. So I mean, ships would sometimes just ship, just change out their flags. There's so many shipping ports that are in Europe. And so it was so easy to smuggle goods. And ultimately it was a completely 
ineffective system, which just hurt, um, which just hurt all the nations that were in it more than actually helped the French. It even hurt the French, right, more than actually helping them. And there were some interesting studies. I'm, I don't remember it off the top of my head, so I'm not going to try and cite any numbers here. But there was an interesting historical article that I read of the economic loss that came from the continental system to France itself. And I thought that was kind of interesting. When Napoleon found out that Russia was flouting the rules of the system and had resumed an illicit trade with Britain, he was furious. With both emperors accusing the other of bad faith, their two countries began preparing for war. This video is brought to you by our sponsor, you Curiosity Stream. Go check it out. See, and that's an interesting question. Are we no longer the soldiers of Austerlitz? And so as we've seen with the defeats that Napoleon has had recently, right, from Charles, obviously, in Austria, although he would end to ultimately get the final victory, as well as his defeats in Spain, although Napoleon is not there directly, arguably this is the army that was not at Austerlitz anymore. The casualties that they've suffered over the multiple years, the tactics and changes that the other countries have gotten used to, this is not the same army. And so if this army, per se, had have faced their greatest challenge just post Austerlitz, obviously the political climate was not in the, in, the, in, the, in the place for that, but had there might have been a different outcome, right? And that's sort of an interesting debate. And let me know what you think in the comment section down below. Napoleon knew an invasion of Russia was a massive undertaking, mm -hmm. especially as he still had an unfinished war in Spain that was tying down more than 200,000 troops. Nevertheless, in 1811, he began to assemble the largest army Europe had ever seen, Crazy. around 600,000 men, though less than half of them were French. The rest came from allied states across Europe. There was a Polish corps from the Duchy of Warsaw, led by Prince Poniatowski, a corps from each of the German kingdoms of Saxony, Westphalia, and Bavaria, from the Kingdom of Italy, as well as Swiss, Dutch, Croat, Spanish and Portuguese units scattered throughout the army. There were even contingents from Prussia and Austria, France's recent enemies, now uneasy allies. Hmm. Some of these allied troops, such as the Poles and Germans, were as reliable as their French counterparts. Others were very inexperienced, or like the Prussians and Austrians, reluctant to be there at all this gigantic formation. And just funny, I just want to draw a little comparison is that when the next massive invasion of Russia would happen in 1942, or correction, in 1941 by the, by the Axis powers, by then Germany under Adolf Hitler, is that Germany would also be marching into, into Russia with uncertain allies, right? The Romanians really didn't want to be there. The Bulgarians didn't take place at all right, in the Soviet Union, although there were some, they had the Air Force. Anyways, point is, there were not boots on the ground and that it seems that between Napoleon and Hitler's invasion, you can draw some similarities. They're not the same, right? History's not black and white, it more or less rhymes, but it's just kind of interesting that he points out there that he has some uneasy allies while marching into Russia and that, you know, a little more than 130 years later, there would also be troops marching into Russia with uneasy allies was deployed in three armies, the main force under Napoleon himself, another led by his stepson Eugène, and a third led by his younger brother Jérôme, King of Westphalia. Neither of these two were experienced commanders. Though one would distinguish himself on campaign, the other would not. On their left flank, Marshal Macdonald led 10th Corps with a large Prussian contingent while the right flank was guarded by General Schwarzenberg's Austrian Corps. Another 100,000 troops were in reserve, including Marshal Victor's 9th Corps. Initially, the Russians only had 220,000 men to face this juggernaut. Organized into Barclay de Tolle's 1st Army, Prince Bagration's 2nd Army, and General Tomasov's 3rd Army. They would be outnumbered 2 to 1. And I mean, again, look at the size of this front, right? This is stretching from 
modern day, let's call it Lithuania, it might be Latvia, either way, Lithuania slash Latvia, right, all the way down, right, to modern, I think this is around Romania, or I think this is Moldova here, right, so just the, the, you know, <laughs> stretching through multiple countries, just this massive, massive front line, and yeah, let's see how they maneuver through it. But in the run-up to war, Russia scored two crucial diplomatic triumphs. Sweden had been at war with Russia just three years earlier, a conflict which cost her Finland. By a curious turn of events, Sweden was now ruled by Napoleon's ex-marshal Bernadotte. Yes. But after Napoleon occupied Swedish Pomerania without warning, a furious Bernadotte promised Russia that Sweden would remain neutral. Meanwhile, a peace treaty with the Ottoman Empire ended Russia's six-year war against its southern rival. These two agreements secured Russia's flanks from any strategic threat, and freed up troops to face Napoleon's invasion. Must be carried through, must it really? Must it really? On the 24th of June, 1812, French troops began crossing the Nyman River into Russian territory. The army was so large, the crossing took five days. Napoleon's plan was to attack north of the impassable Pripet marshes and defeat Barclay's army, while Jerome pinned Bagration in place. French forces would then swing south to trap Bagration. Napoleon expected the campaign to be over in five weeks. <laughs> but the sheer sun Again, right, going back to our to our Axis comparison. It was also thought to be a very short campaign, although yeah, to say <laughs> to say the least, it was anything but. Eyes of the French army. And it's just funny to have that sort of how much of this is really poor planning and how much of this is ego, how much do these uh, really what would you say? synergize into overall just a bad situation for the French here. He convinced the cautious Barclay that retreat was his only option. Prince Bagration, a much more aggressive commander by instinct, and often Barclay's fierce critic, was forced to agree. As they withdrew, they burned villages and crops, yep. part of a scorched earth strategy to deny supplies to the enemy. A smart one of that. In four days, Napoleon had reached Vilnius, but Barclay was gone. To the south, Jerome failed to pin down Bagration. So when Davout's first corps swung southeast to trap him, he'd already withdrawn to safety. Napoleon's younger brother was out of his depth, stung by the Emperor's criticism, humiliated when his troops were put under Marshal Davout's command, he resigned his post and returned to Westphalia. The campaign was already beginning to expose serious flaws in Napoleon's plan. Knowing his troops would struggle to live off the land in this impoverished region, he'd organized huge supply depots and transport units to feed the army. But wagons rolled slowly along Russia's bad roads, which were turned to rivers of mud by summer thunderstorms. And again, <laughs> <laughs> right? I won't do this the whole video, but it's stre long supply lines that are very slow, are very cumbersome, are often, or can also be targeted by raids from guerrilla fighters or anything like this, as well as the longer you get into Russia, the longer the roads stretch out, the harder it is to get supplies, the more disruptive it becomes. As he said, there's poor infrastructure in a lot of these places. Yeah. Yikes. The army had to make frequent stops to allow its supplies to catch up. Bad news for Napoleon's plan to catch the Russians, but a much needed relief for the many thousands of young conscripts in his army, not used to hard marches day after day. Many were soon dropping out with exhaustion, others deserted. There were also huge problems of command and control over a vast multinational army that was three times bigger than any Napoleon had commanded before. La Grande Armée, once famed for its speed of manoeuvre, 
had become a lumbering beast. Yep. After a pause to rest. Uh, again, it's the least sexy things that are the most important when it comes to war. Command, control, supply, right? Logistics. It's all the things that it's, it's not always about technology or in, in the modern sense, right? The most effective tanks, the most effective weapons, the most this, the most that. It always comes down to command, control, supply, right? Or if you just want to call it logistics and command. Rest and regroup at Vilnius, Napoleon resumed his advance. Barclay continued his retreat to Vitebsk, where he hoped Bagration's second army would be able to join him. But Davu blocked Bagration's path at Sultanovka, forcing him to make for Smolensk instead. At Vitebsk, Napoleon clashed with Barclay's rearguard, but once more the Russians escaped after setting fire to all the stores they couldn't take with them. Meanwhile, 300 miles away, on Napoleon's southern flank, Russian 3rd Army attacked and defeated the Saxon 7th Corps, hmm. forcing Napoleon to divert Schwarzenberg's Austrian Corps to their aid. By the end of July, Napoleon had advanced 250 miles into Russia, much further than he'd planned and the long marches in extreme summer heat continued to take a heavy toll on his men. And in that uniform? Without fighting a major battle, the army had already suffered 20% casualties from exhaustion and illness, particularly typhus and dysentery. The army had entered Russia with a quarter of a million horses, but they were now dying at a rate of a thousand every day from exhaustion and lack of fodder. It wasn't just cavalry horses that were dying, but the very horses that were supposed to haul the army's transport wagons, making a bad situation worse. worse. This crisis in horsepower came just as the French light cavalry, Napoleon's eyes and ears, met their match in Russia's Cossacks. Oh, and he was captured. He was captured too. Okay, that's Cossacks. even better. Actually, self-reliant, proud, ruthless, and superb horsemen didn't play by the same rules as other European cavalry. Every day they shadowed Napoleon's army, swooping in whenever they saw an easy target, but melting away into the forests if they were attacked by a stronger force. Very clever. Cossacks, as well as Russian partisans, made hit-and-run attacks on French supply lines and depots, forcing Napoleon said. to divert thousands of troops to their defence. Alongside Russian regular light cavalry, they also prevented French patrols from carrying out reconnaissance, which meant that Napoleon often lacked good information about roads or the enemy's whereabouts. Napoleon stayed 16 days at Vitebsk, resting his troops and considering his options. Among his many mounting concerns was the security of his long, exposed flanks. But at Vitebsk, he received news that Schwarzenberg had defeated the Russians at Gorodezhna. A week later at Polatsk, a French Bavarian force fought Wittgenstein's Russian 1st Corps to a standstill. Napoleon's flanks were secure, for now. Although his main force had been reduced to less than half its original strength, Napoleon decided to push on to Smolensk and try to force the Russians into a decisive battle for the city. And just that in half, in just a few months. Crazy. Crazy. Barclay was indeed under pressure to give battle from fellow commander Prince Bagration and Emperor Alexander in St. Petersburg. The army's morale and Russia's honor required it, they told him. Is that the right idea, though? With the first and second Russian armies finally linking up near Smolensk, Barclay decided to attack Napoleon's army, which he believed was concentrated around Rudnya. 
the offensive was led by General Platov's Cossacks, who surprised a French cavalry division at Inkova. But alarmed by false reports that Eugène's IV Corps was outflanking him to the north, Barclay called off the attack. Napoleon, reassured that Barclay's offensive posed no real threat, began a grand outflanking move to the south, to take Smolensk and cut off the Russian retreat. Okay. The so-called Smolensk manoeuvre was Napoleon at his best, <laughs> using Murat's cavalry to screen his movements and keep Barclay in the dark. The Emperor reached the Dnieper on the evening of the 13th of August. His engineers quickly threw up four pontoon bridges, and by dawn the next day, his army was across. Not bad. Marshal Davout led really a second quick. column That's across really the quick. river at Orsha. Huh. But a single Russian division, the 27th, fought a heroic fighting retreat from Krasny, delaying the French advance and buying time for Bagration to reinforce the Smolensk garrison. The chance for a surprise assault on the city was lost. And as the Russian army began to pull back, Napoleon displayed an uncharacteristic lack of urgency, even halting the army for a parade to mark his 43rd birthday. No, what? When the main attack- No, you gotta be kidding me. He halted up and he did a pr Oh, okay. As someone who's had to do a decent amount of uh, a decent amount of parades in my my time in the in the reserves is that <laughs> I can only imagine you're you're in the middle of a of a war you're in Russia and then your captain comes down or your lieutenant or whatever right your 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 junior or senior officer and says yeah we're doing a parade for the emperor it's his birthday I'd be like are you kidding me <laughs> I would be I would be so upset. <laughs> That's fascinating. I never knew that, that he held the army to hold a parade for his birthday. That takes at least a day, right? With all the with all the uh, maneuvering that you have to do around that, too. Wow. Crazy. Huh. Back on Smolensk began two days later. Napoleon opted for a frontal assault. A hundred and... I hate parades. <laughs> 50 French guns battered the city as three French corps attacked its medieval fortifications. The Russians resisted bravely, but Barclay, fearing encirclement, ordered another retreat. With Smolensk in flames, the Russians began to pull out. Just as the French fought their way into the city, to scenes of utter devastation. Yep. Bagration's second army withdrew first, as Barclay's army followed, its rear guard was caught by Ney's 3rd Corps at Valutino. General Junot, commanding the Westphalian 8th Corps, Ooh, uh -oh. had orders to cut off Barclay's retreat. Uh -oh. But having crossed the river, he did nothing, and the opportunity was lost. Why? A furious Napoleon. Wait, why though? Why, 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 why? Why did he not do anything? Is, are they going to talk about Hold on, hold on swore that Juno would never now win his marshal's battle. Why did he not do anything though? Was there some sort of Okay, there's got to be there's got to be some explanation for this that's probably available somewhere, but I'm very curious why Juno did not attack there. Uh, did he have the wrong information? Did he assume that he wasn't that that it was too large of a force for him to take on? I'm very curious. I wish they would get into the reason why, but it's got to be in there's there's got to be some reason for it. If you do know it, I'm actually very curious. Type it in the comment section down below. I'd really appreciate that. The Battle of Smolensk cost both sides around 10,000 casualties and destroyed one of Russia's most historic and holy cities. Shame. But settled nothing. Yep. Shada. <laughs> Yep. After the missed chance to defeat the Russians at Smolensk, Napoleon paused once more to consider his options. His men were weary and far from home, and it was already late in the campaigning season. He considered sitting out the Russian winter at Smolensk and resuming the campaign in 1813. Not a bad option. But now he was just 230 miles from Moscow. A century earlier, Peter the Great had moved Russia's capital to St. Petersburg. Yep. 
but Moscow remained its historic and spiritual heart, a prize for which the Russians had to fight. Napoleon, always a gambler, decided to push on. The Russians faced their own dilemma. Emperor Alexander had experienced a kind of religious epiphany that summer, and rallied the Russian people to the country's defence, describing the war with Napoleon as a war to save Holy Mother Russia from yep. the Antichrist. Yep. For months. And again, Napoleon's not only being painted as the Antichrist by, um, by the Russians here, but also the Catholic forces that are about in, in, in Europe. Right, also painting him as a godless figure, right, one that has rejected the Catholic Church, although that's not exactly true. But hey, right, for propaganda-wise, especially in Spain here too, where they're also considering the Antichrist, right, all these forces are really coming together to, to, to try and unify the people and everyone against Napoleon. And if you really make him into a, a spiritual figure of evil, it gets people, you know, it gives them more of a reason to fight on. The Emperor had received conflicting advice – to stand and fight, or retreat. Now he decided change was needed. The cautious General Barclay kept his job, but the Emperor summoned General Mikhail Kutuzov mm. to take overall command of Russia's armies. Kutuzov had been beaten by Napoleon at Austerlitz yep. seven years before. But he'd since won several victories against the Ottoman Empire, and was a true Russian, loved by the troops. Although Kutuzov agreed with Barclay's strategy of delay, he saw that constant retreats were destroying the soldiers' and the nation's morale. If Moscow was given up without a battle, the fallout could be disastrous. That's fair. And so, 70 miles west of the city, near the village ah, of Borodino, yes. The Russian army prepared to make a stand. I think one of the bloodiest days in European history, I think. Europe was about to witness the bloodiest day's fighting of the Napoleonic Wars. Okay, the Napoleonic Wars. <sighs> Thank and you there to we go. all our... Thank you, that was fantastic. A great introductory thing there. I'm really curious why Juno did not attack. I'm very interested in that. And I think, too, what's going to be great is that when we get into the Marshall series, um, and the, I think it's five parts overall, where it goes through every single one of Napoleon's marshals, although Juno was not a marshal, that this will give even more context to these older videos. And yeah, I think that would be great. Thank you very much for joining me. I really hope you're enjoying it so far. Next one's is going to be out in a couple days, and if you haven't already yet, please remember to like, comment, subscribe. Go back, check out the old videos. Let me know what you think in the comment section down below. Take care. All the best. Thank you again. Thank you for your support. See you in the next one.